death. There are no accidents, no coincidences, no mishaps, and no escapes. What you have to realize is that we're all just a mouse that a cat has by the tail. Every single move we make, from the mundane to the monumental, the red light that we stop at or run, the people we have sex with or won't with us, the airplanes that we ride or walk out of, it's all part of death's sadistic design leading to the grave. Hello everyone, welcome back to another bonus episode of the Evolution of Horror. This week we've got something really exciting for you. Over the last few weeks over on Patreon, I've been running a little Final Destination retrospective, a mini-series in which me and various guests have been watching through and discussing every Final Destination movie in the series. And to coincide with that, I got to sit down and chat with the man that created it all, the writer of the original Final Destination movie, Jeffrey Reddick, the man whose brain this whole idea came from initially. So he was very kind uh, to give me an hour of his time, and we discussed everything from the origins of Final Destination to his thoughts and feelings about some of the sequels and the legacy that these movies have left behind. Uh, I know that for so many people, Final Destination is such a beloved franchise, and it's been so much fun to revisit these films and then to get to discuss them with Jeffrey. So don't forget, if you want to hear our discussions of all five Final Destination movies, head on over to our Patreon channel, patreon.com slash evolution of horror. At the $10 per month level, you will get access to that Final Destination retrospective. But right here on the main feed, you can hear my discussion with the creator of this incredible franchise, it's Jeffrey Reddick. I will not let this plane crash be the most important thing in my life! God! I'm moving on, Carter. And if you want to waste your life beating the shit out of Alex every time you see him, then you can just drop fucking dead. It is my great pleasure to welcome to the podcast the writer and creator of the original Final Destination, Jeffrey Reddick. Hello, Jeffrey. Hey, how are you doing there, Mike? Really good, thank you. How are you? I'm good. I, I don't have it. I didn't have caffeine this morning, so I oh, I'm, I'm just. Pre- <laughs> making that energy you know, <laughs> on my own. Oh my God. Well, thank you for being here without the caffeine. That's very thoughtful of you. Um, <laughs> um, so I would love to start off by asking you a little bit about the origins of Final Destination. Let's just start at the very beginning. How did this idea first come to you? Am I right in thinking that Final Destination originally started life as a kind of spec script for an X-Files episode? Is that right? Yes. It was never submitted to the X-Files, but I wrote it to get an agent I, i'll start at the very beginning um yeah i got the i got the kernel for the idea when i was um actually that's funny because the kernel for this idea and then the kernel for the opening of the second one but i came when i was going home uh, from new york to kentucky to visit my family and i was taking a flight and i read an article about a woman and i don't remember exactly i think it, she was going to hawaii for like her vacation um and her mother had told her not to take the next flight she was supposed to be on the next day because she had a bad feeling about it so the woman changed her flight and it was the story was like you know did she avert death you know like because she the plane that she was on crashed and so i was on a plane and i was like oh that's an interesting idea you know so just something i filed away in my head as like an interesting you know somebody calling like i have a bad feeling about a flight and um i moved to new york when i was 19 i was studying acting for a while got into to segue over into writing and so to get an agent back in the back in the day they would have you write a spec script for something that was on tv um so that they know that you can write other characters voices so x files was my favorite show at the time on tv um as i think it was so many people's and um i was like oh that would be a good setup for like an opening scene you know for the for an x files episode and i decided to make it uh, scully's brother charles who was kind of like the brother we didn't see a lot of in the show and so you know i wrote it as an x-files episode i was really proud of the the script uh but one of my friends at new line cinema um i i actually when i went to new york i started interning at new line cinema um one of my friends there was like dude this is a really good idea for a feature um so i'm kind of mixing in how the business stuff happened as well as a creative but um at the time i had uh a really good friend of mine, Chris ben- Bender, had worked at New Line Cinema. He had started working for two producers, Warren Zide and Craig Perry, 
who had a first look deal at New Line. So by this point, I'd been at New Line for about six years. Um, and I'd submitted stuff I'd written. Some of my early stuff was horrible. Um, you know, you get better as you go reading, reading a lot of scripts and stuff like that. Um, so I knew at that point, I was like, you know, I should, if I have an idea, I should hook up with a producer who's got a deal at New Line to bring it into New Line as, as opposed to me just handing it in myself. Because I just knew that that would help kind of give it some legitimacy outside of, oh, I, you know, he works here. Um, so um, I gave it to Warren Zide and Craig Perry, you know, and, um, you know, Chris Bender. And they picked, you know, I have like three ideas and they picked that one to develop. And um, we developed it into like a probably a 14 page treatment, um, which was kind of a whole movie beat it out. And it kept changing. Um, originally, it was all adults. And then Scream came out and then it was such a hit. And it's one of my favorite movies too. Um, and they're like, well, we, you know, teenagers are hot again, so we should make them all teenagers. So then I changed it to a American class going to, to France. Um, and uh, it was a hard sell, honestly, like, because they love the concept, but they're like, we just don't get how you can have death be the killer. Like every, every horror franchise has like a Freddy or a Jason. And we're just, we don't get the death thing. We can't, we don't understand it. So we, we ended up kind of doing a half and half where there was like, you don't see anything. There's like a shadowy figure that's kind of taunting the kids. Um, and my original, my original script was very dark, uh, because I wanted to kind of set up that since Alex had the premonition, he wasn't supposed to die in the crash. Like he doesn't realize this till later, but everybody else was. And also I w was like, well, death couldn't get them the first time. So I, I was basically, cause I'm a huge Nightmare on Elm Street fan. Um, there was a lot of Nightmare on Elm Street influence where death was basically mind screwing. <laughs> Watch my language. Every time I get on a podcast, I start cursing left and right. So I, I'm- uh, You can curse on this podcast. Oh, it's fine. Okay. Don't worry. Well, no, but death <laughs> like mind fucked the kids over something, you know, like their survivors guild and stuff. And they would end up killing themselves, but it would kind of look you know, at first it wasn't, it wasn't just looking like they had survivors go and were killing themselves. Um, but it was a lot more dark and heavy. So, um, wrote that dr draft. Um, the first time I've ever experienced for myself and a lot of people like the studio green lit it off the first draft. Um, and we actually went out to Clive Barker. That was the first director we went out to and he passed on it. Um, but then, you know, we went out to James Wong and Glenn Morgan, who actually worked on the X Files. Yeah. So Bob Shea, um, who kind of kept me very involved in the in the process, was like, "What do you think about the James Wong and Glenn Morgan?" I'm like, "Oh my god, I fucking love those guys. Yeah. <laughs> they, one of my favorite episodes of the X Files." Um, so they came on and they did they did a, a pretty big restructuring of the script. And the thing that I am very appreciative of is I think my dark dark version would have been very. Um, horror fans and nightmare fans would have loved it, but it would have been very specific to that. And it was James and Glenn who came up with the Rube Goldberg aspect of it. Like death using, instead of death haunting you, you know, and tormenting you directly, it would just use things around you to kill you. So that I think grounded it in the real world um, and probably made it a lot more accessible. Cause I've met so many people over the years who are like, I don't normally like horror films, but this one I like, cause it's not, you know, it's bloody, but it's kind of fun bloody. So yeah, that for that first movie, it was like, it was, you know, I sort of, I went down to visit set. Um, I actually shot a cameo, which never, never made it anywhere. Like they, they built the whole like aircraft security checkpoint. I was a security guard that waving Alex and, and, they, and checking them out. Um, and that scene, it's, I don't, it's, it's in storage somewhere. I'm gonna have to start like a hashtag movement, like release the <laughs> Jeffrey cam. But no, it was, it was, it was a great experience being at a studio and watching it kind of yeah. develop and, you know, giving notes on the rewrites and, and things like that. And visiting the set, um, I lived in New York and not Los Angeles. So I'd kind of grown up in the, the Uber creative side of it. Yeah. You know, the New York was very creative. Not that the, the LA office was creative as well, but that's where, you know, all the, you know, stars and all the agents and all the, the big wigs were, so, you know, watching them put the marketing campaign together, like it was just, it was a lot of fun. And when the movie came out, um, suspected that it would do well. I mean, I didn't ever suspect that kind of the phrase like 
the final destination moment or something like that was going to like be part of the culture. Like you don't expect something like that, but I always had planned on it at least having a sequel or two, like in my brain, I was like, you know, and I remember, remember when it opened because horror movies, you know, they usually open really big and then they draw about 50% on their second weekend. And, um, new line was still, they, they liked the movie. It tested well, but they still weren't sure how general audiences would take not having a killer that you can see running around. So they, they put, they, they did a decent marketing push, but they didn't put as much money behind it as they would have like a Nightmare on Elm Street movie. Uh, but when the box office is, you know, numbers were coming in during the week, they were like, oh shit, the movie's actually ticking up and not going down. So the second week, it actually did better than the first week. Um, so then they started pumping money into marketing yeah. it. And uh, it really became a word of mouth hit. I mean, there's no, that's one of the rare like word of mouth hits because the audiences were talking about it. And, and it just, yeah, it stayed there. I, if I remember correctly, it stayed in the top five box office over every other movie that was released in March of that year. There were a couple of big studio movies that came out that opened big, but by the end of the month, they dropped out of the top five and we were still in the top five. So. Um, that's amazing well I remember the marketing at the time I would have been about 13 when this film came out in the UK and I remember being so excited by that point I was I was already a big horror fan I was obsessed with sort of Scream and the 90s slashes and uh, yeah I remember there was that marketing for the film that would kind of show night vision footage of audiences kind of screaming in cinemas and all that kind of thing yeah and so like you know that kind of stuff was really exciting and I I loved the film when I first saw it and I think there's that really interesting balance in Final Destination of making it incredibly scary, but also making it incredibly fun, right? And I, I, I just wanted to ask you, how was that for you as a writer, kind of pulling off that balance, I suppose? Because we're dealing with teenagers facing death here. And this first movie in particular, this changes in the sequels, I think. But in the first movie, there is that real weight of death and grief and loss. You know, you feel the weight of death in that first movie, as well as it being this kind of roller coaster ride. Yeah. I suppose. Well, I mean, that's, I, I think that's kind of a hallmark of most of the things that I write. Like, I mean, I, I love, I love being scared, but I love being entertained scared. Like, a, a, like, again, Nightmare on Elm Street is like one of my favorite movies. And, and the first one is terrifying, but because Freddie's having so much fun, you know, kind of toying with the victims and, you know, Nancy's such a great final girl and this, everything is so amazing. Like for me, it's always been about, having fun with the movies. Um, so that's part of my creative DNA when I write stuff is I try to write, I mean, even though I know the suicide version sounds re- really heavy, um, there was, there was humor coming from the characters and some of the, some of the humor was from the like, Oh shit kind of way that people, people died. So, um, you know, I think, um, especially, you know, James Glenn, I think they both have a very, you know, dark sense of humor. If you look at their work also, I think they brought that to play in the first movie. Um, you, know, you know, they just have a dark sense of humor and, you know, it's it's in all of their work as well. So, um, yeah, you know, I think that that's, that's it. And so by the time we got to the second one, because I knew the, um, I knew the MO, death's MO had changed from like, you know, mentally driving you to commit suicide mm-hmm. to like the Rube Goldberg thing. Um, then for the second one, it was just trying to come up with fun things that where people see or kind of are in everyday situations where they, where they find themselves in everyday situations. And I think that's kind of the key to the success of the films is, is it is like, you know, you try to create moments where that people, that a majority of people will find themselves in several times in their lives so that when they go to like the eye doctor or when they get behind a log truck or, you know, it's something like that. Like they're going to, they're going to be like, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. No, totally. I think that's um, true. It, it taps into something very human, I think, about all of us, particularly those first couple of movies. Are you somebody, Jeffrey, generally, who kind of thinks about death a lot? Are you somebody that catastrophizes? You know, I've got friends who say every time they kind of walk across the street, it occurs to them that something might happen to them or whatever. Are you Are you that sort of person? No, I'm kind of the opposite. I think I, I, think I probably should um, not catastrophize more. I do that about work stuff. <laughs> like, yeah, <laughs> I do that about, yeah. about industry work stuff. But you no, know, like, um, 
I have a friend that's like, yeah, you should write a will. I'm like, I'm too young to write a will. He's like, no, you're not. Um, I'm like, oh, I guess I so I, I clearly probably don't worry. I mean, I'm, I'm mindful of my safety, but uh, yeah, I don't walk around worrying about. And then sometimes I'll, I'll hear about a friend who's died suddenly and then it, it shocks me. But, um, you know, I, I, I don't know. My mom lived to be 97. So I just kind of have this thing in my head like that. I, at least I'm going to be around to like 97. So amazing. We need time yeah. to worry about death. Um, <laughs> yeah. Do you, do you ever get fear of, you know, flying or anything like that when you get on a plane? No, no, I don't get a fear of flying. Um, I've been on a couple of flights where there was a lot of turbulence and my first thought was like, well, this would be ironic. You know, I don't think that, yeah. I think that's the misuse of ironic actually. Um, <laughs> or a set in that song yeah. um yeah. but um yeah but i'd be like this would be funny you know if this happened um i mean but i like i don't like i would never skydive like there are things i wouldn't i would just never do like never skydive um but yeah flying and things i i oh i don't like roller coasters um i didn't come up with that one. that was james and glenn but um i only like the roller coaster if it loops once you know <laughs> And a smaller loop, like if it's one of those friggin' tycoon ones or what, you know, or it's like <laughs> yeah. tycoons, I'm like, no way, forget it. So I don't like being, I don't like being out of control in situations, mm. but flying, I don't really, yeah, I don't worry about flying or. That that first movie as well, I mean, like it, in some ways it was such a different era, wasn't it? And, and of course it was pre 9-11 as well, right? Mm. I mean, like mm. what would have happened had that movie been made like a year later or 18 months later I like would you know like i wonder what would that yeah. have would it have happened i suppose i don't think i honestly don't think it would have actually like i yeah where they would have changed the if it had been shot they probably wouldn't have released it for a long time yeah and i know that it's always just because some so there's some, some rumors i like to address but you know like you know i saw the movie in 97 and i know there was a there was an actual plane that was flying from new york to france that crashed and people thought that we like wrote the movie like people don't know how long it takes to make movies so they thought that w the movie was inspired by that and it's like no like i i try not to like i wouldn't i should say never because as i get older i might get desperate and just be like screw it i'll take advantage of something horrible that happened <laughs> but um but you know i like that yeah that wasn't part of you know that was a tragedy that happened after the movie was in yeah. the can yeah of course. um I keep wondering if we're going to get a wave of COVID horror movies at some point soon. Like we've had the odd couple, right? But I keep wondering, yeah. like, it's going to be really interesting to see what horror cinema particularly is going to look like in the wake of everything that's happened over the last two or three years you yeah. know, as well. But like you said, it takes a long time, I'm sure, for, for these things to happen. So we probably won't know for another decade, you know, how that how that ripple effect occurred, you know? Yeah. Well, Ken, mm. is he sick? Uh, Kevin Williamson's movie? Yeah, I don't think it's oh, it actually be gotten a player. Yeah. yeah, it's it's still not gotten a release here, which is so annoying okay. because I love Kevin Williamson, but I haven't I haven't had a chance to see it yet. Okay, I, yeah, I think his movie of the COVID movies I've seen so far, like that one, I think feels like it's really takes place during that time, but it also is saying it's. It's a. It doesn't feel like a gimmick. Like that's all I want. Mm. Well, it's a really good movie. Um, and actually, speaking of Kevin Williamson as well, I mean, you mentioned so you you made some changes for it to kind of uh, fit in with that kind of wave of scream kind esque horror movies, I guess, right through the late nineties, which is a really kind of younger, interesting thing with the younger characters. Yeah, like right. Yeah, because in my original version, yeah, there was like an elderly couple that got off the plane, and there was a, you know, yeah, there were just all there were a couple of teenagers, but then there were there were adults and older there's an elderly couple too mm -hmm. they had a, but that was a tree at the treatment stage and then scream came out and they're like how about we make them teenagers i'm like all right like i you know i know this is yes i will i will make them teenagers um, yeah perfect, perfect. <laughs> uh what do you and and that incredible cast too right like it felt like it was again in very in keeping with that wave of horror movies that we were getting in that p point you know i remember even you know that those sort of times you'd always get the posters with the kind of lineup of the teen cast right and these were the movies i grew up watching and loving but that was also like a who's who of kind of teen sort of tv and movie stars right at the time which yeah was cool. it was really cool because um you know devon sour was uh, obviously had done a lot at that point and it was so nice because you know i wanted to shake things up a little bit and have a final guy in my movie um mm. and um ali lard come off of varsity blues um and so she was really hot and the funny thing is craig perry who's 
I always call him like the, I don't want to call him the grandfather that makes him sound old, but you know, he's like the stepdaddy of the franchise. He's a producer that's been with it from the beginning and I, I adore that man. He's one of the best producers I've worked with, but he also produced American Pie. So mm. basically was like, hey, there's this kid, Sean William Scott, and you guys got to put him in final light. Like this kid's going to blow up. Um, and so we got we got Stifler like before before he I mean, he blew up with American Pie, but we got him like while he was still not blown up to the world. So yeah, um, here's yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah from Dawson's Creek and who ended at Murr. And of course, my favorite, um, Tony Todd. Um, so I had kind of it was funny because I lived in New York at the time and. You know, we're seeing a, a shift now, obviously, with showing diversity and casting. But since the movie was set in New York, the only thing I said is like, hey, let's just make sure the class looks like it's from New York. You know, like, I, you yeah. know, I, you know, I wrote like one character, you know, my, my, in my draft, it was a sister that got on the plane and a sister that stayed off and James changed them to brothers. But in my script, you know, they were, they were, it was a two black sisters. But I was like, at least, you know, in, even in the background, let's make it look, like New York, like, and but they shot it in Canada. We've shot most of my movies in Canada. I actually love Canada. Um, so I think probably, yeah, that got lost in translation when they started casting everybody in Canada. So they finally, they're like, well, um, you know, we would like to get Tony Todd for the mortician. What do you think about that? I'm like, are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> get Tony yeah. Todd for anything in my movie and I will be dead. Cause I, I have, Candyman's one of my favorite I've got like oh. five and Candyman's in, in my top five for sure. And, and, um, so I had the pleasure, I, I had the pleasure of meeting all of them. I'm still really good friends with Devin, um, and, and Tony, and I, I just love both of them. They're just so freaking amazing. There, there's a, there's a theory fans have about Tony Todd's character, right? The, the mortician character. Is there something actually supernatural about him in your head? Like, you know, when he arrives, he kind of like emerges from these like fires of hell almost, yeah. right? And he kind of pops up at these strange times. What 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 is your kind of interpretation of his character? My interpretation is that uh, and this is not a cop out. This is just I he's been kept vaguely vague for a reason. <laughs> To let, sure, well, I think sure, to let, yeah. and I, I'm not, like, cause, cause honestly, like in, in my, I, you know, I go back to like in my draft, that character was a guy who had been through what Alex had gone through. So he was one that was like, you know, I survived by doing this and you weren't supposed to die in the crash. So when James and Glenn brought up, you know, did the rewrite, they made it, that made him a mortician. And so they kept him intentionally vague. And then I know when we started working on the second movie, and then, you know, on the subsequent sequels, I've known that they've intentionally wanted to just keep, like, who and how he knows all this stuff vague. Like, you know, is he, like, you know, is he death? Is he, like, just a, at a hinge? Yeah. You know, is he somebody that's just really can Because he knows all the rules. Like, he knows, you know. Right. Which, which always change every movie on how you can get out of, out of this. <laughs> but, um... But yeah, I mean, his. I think his character is one of you know the fan favorites. I mean, he's, um, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm hoping, I'm hoping he comes back for the next one. I'm hoping they bring him back for the next one because. What, what are your like? Before I move on to the the next movie, I just want to ask like, what are your? It's been what twenty three years since this movie was released. Like, how often do you revisit the original Final Destination, and what are your sort of thoughts on it now? Like, when you look back at it, is there? Do you still think it holds up? Is there anything that you would change about it? Like, what are your thoughts generally? On I mean, the movie? i've I've seen I've seen it a lot, um, either for myself or like screenings, or if I go to like conventions and stuff, they'll be like, "Let's watch Final Destination," and I love it. I love it, but yeah, I see that, you know, even from the dailies when they first were coming in to like rough cuts, I've seen the movie, <laughs> movie a lot. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I, I do think it holds up, um, especially again, if you're not a horror fan, like I think it's a really good gateway, kind of scary, fun movie to get, get you into place. Um, I mean, I, I, I love most of it. I mean, there's, there's a couple of things I, you know, there's a couple of like, things that were done with characters that I was like, Oh, I think this character could be more layered or this could, this could be, you know, done better. Um, but overall, I really, I mean, it's, you know, it's my first big movie. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm just really happy with, with how it turned out. Like, I mean, it's got a great visual style to it. I think, 
um you know Devin does an amazing job as Alex um yeah you know there's so many layers to that and it's you know and again it's it's hard to you know society but you know you know you're not used to seeing like a lot except you know more recently but you weren't used to seeing like final guys in movies back then who had to be like scared and frightened and still strong and stuff like that so he just brought so many layers of that character that um we had a great cast there's not a, there's not a bad egg in the cast and uh carter is so like carter hates alex so so much and i was talking about it with my friend who you know joshua tonks and we were like yeah is there something going on here does is carter actually in love with alex is that is that what's really going on here why is he so so angry at alex yeah well the funny thing is um if i was writing this script if if that had been my because in, in my draft because what that's i was kind of dancing around some of the like that like that's one of my things is like you know they kind of rewrote carter to be such a dick yeah. from the oh like that's that's his only character trait is like i'm a dick like every time you walk around he's like shoving people punching people knocking people down um so i don't know and billy's always falling off a bicycle like i don't even know why he's <laughs> bicycle but he's falling off of it all the time um so in my script it was he wasn't he wasn't at, he wasn't such an asshole he was they, there were a lot more layers to him that got stepped out um since since we're on the in this subject area i will say like there was a there was a little drama on with the first script because when i got the rewrite in there were there were like three fag kind of comments and jokes in the script and um so i you know i would always bob would give me every draft of the script then i'd write my notes and i'm like hey um we don't need we've got like a they there was a joke before they went to the bathroom. There was a fag comment on the plane. Then there was a there was another. There were like three within the first thirty pages. And I wrote back to Bob and I'm like, "Hey, we don't really need any of these, but we don't need three of them in the first thirty pages. Like it's it just stands out." And so they kept putting that note into the notes that went back to James and Glenn, and they were like, "Hey, could you take you know?" And they kept coming back. Yeah with comments still in there so finally i wrote bob uh, just an email directly because you, you normally i would email him and he put my stuff in the the notes that went back from the studio and i was like bob i don't understand why this why these were still in here i said i'm gay if i'm doing publicity for these like what happens when somebody asks like well, you know what about these fag things what am i gonna i'm gonna say oh i tried to get them to take them out and they wouldn't do it mm. so Bob just forwarded that email to James and Glenn directly without any context or without telling them that, oh, we've been giving Jeffrey every draft of the script and getting his input. Um, so that caused a little bit of drama. Um, yeah. The things went out, but but um, but um, Todd still mouths fag to Alex on the plane, which again, I'm not, I'm not, um, you know, I'm not opposed to that, somebody using that word if it's like part of their character, but literally in the... There were three other instances where I'm like, this is just guys don't say that, yeah. you know? Yeah. And actually it's, it's a weird thing. Cause there's a, it feels like we kind of went a step backwards in, in, in cinema and in horror cinema through the two thousands. Cause it feels like in, in the nineties, there was a kind of really nice wave of kind of interesting sort of female led or female driven horror and teen movies, you know, with stuff like Kevin scream and, and final destination too, actually, like you say, having a final boy and having these kind of interesting for the most part, likable characters. When you get into the kind yeah. of, uh, Eli Roth's hostel and you know, the, those kind of movies, it did feel like the tide turned and 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 things became kind of for whatever reason sort of meaner i guess and for, for some people yeah. for horror cinema that's a better thing you know for, uh, big people have different opinions of it but did you kind of feel that as a writer that you know horror movies were sort of beginning to change in in this new decade of the 2000s i mean yeah they they definitely started getting more brutal which i'm i'm fine with like i you know if, if the concept especially if the concept merits it like i thought uh saw had a concept that merited merited the brutality like i i thought it was really good um you know i remember um you know when when i was a teenager like that's all my friends cared about was like boobs and blood and i was like boo mm. you know i mean I, I wasn't boobs i was blood they were boobs and blood but that's all they cared about in the movies is like <laughs> how much blood can we see um but then i think as the horror fans got older than the you know and especially as filmmakers like wes craven and john carpenter started making more films that were not just about blood 
and mm. it's like fans started evolving and started wanting more and then i think we kind of got back to the at least the blood part of it you know and then it turned into, like, let's see how who can torture people the most you know like let's how, how far we can push it um the final destination franchise i think you know this is something that i'm always kind of interested in um looking at in in horror is these kind of trends and the way in which the genre has shifted and evolved and in some ways the final destination franchise feels like a really interesting middle point between those kind of glossy 90s horrors and the slightly kind of gorier saw type movies where you're watching these big elaborate death scenes happen right it almost feels like the final destination is that middle point between those kind of two eras of horror you know yeah interesting. and i think with well, this nation, like the the key to to those movies, it's not so much the death itself. It's kind of building that mousetrap kind of yeah. You know, it ha- is it going to happen this way? Is it going to happen this way? Is it going to happen this way? Uh, mm-hmm. So I think that that's yeah, where exactly. the, that's where it's like not so much we're going to torture somebody to till they die. It's more like what the hell's going to what's going to fall on them or crush them or cut them yes. or, or what's going to get them so where is it going to come from exactly and actually speaking of let me ask you about final destination 2 which i i remember very vividly i was 16 when this came out i saw it in the movie theater with friends we had the best time and i remember everyone in the cinema screaming screaming and laughing and you know like and it feels like even now it's it's one of the fans favorite movies right do you sort of feel that yourself as someone involved in them it feels like often people cite it as their favorite of the bunch yeah it's kind of my honestly it's kind of my favorite too because i feel like it's closer to i mean even though again like is there every film and every creative process is evolving so again like you know i finalization went from like an x-files mystery to like you know adult to teenager to um you know su- death making people commit suicide but once once we yeah once we locked into the rube goldberg aspect of it um i felt a lot more ownership of the second one because i got to i got to really do you know i wrote the story for that one and i got to do what i love doing in sequels which is bringing back you know some of the og players and expanding the mythology and mm-hmm. retelling the same movie um i was really proud and they kind of just brush it off in the van but it's still up uh, but it's like oh yeah i had a i cheated death too because somebody from the first movie was alive so i'm i love that moment yeah yeah. but i made more of a meal of it in my treatment but i was like well at least it's out but you know it expanded the mythology and it connect it showed that we're all connected um and the log truck opening that was you know i i Originally, the I, it was going to be a hotel fire. They, I think they used that for a comic book um, version. But the producer was like, oh, we need." Craig was like, "We need something bigger. We need something bigger than a mm-hmm. hotel fire." And again, I was heading back to Kentucky to see my family, and I got behind a log truck, and I pulled over, and then I pulled off the freeway, and I called Craig, and I was like, really excited. He's like, "Well, slow down. I can't understand you." And I'm like, "What about a log truck on a freeway and the chain snaps and the logs?" And he's like, "That's it. That's the opening." So yeah um yeah uh phenomenal opening set piece right yeah, like right. i think again like one of those moments that the franchise is sort of remembered for yeah um it's interesting isn't it what is it about that sequence do you think specifically that has really still to this day 20 years later struck a chord like you'll see like memes of it every day almost online yeah you know? well i think it's two things i think one we all drive and there's all somebody yeah you know there's either a very secure log truck in front of us or there's somebody with a really janky setup that's like got some rope over shit and you're like that that's this is not safe so i think part mm-hmm. of it, that you just see that um but i also i mean david ellis who's no longer with us unfortunately directed that movie um and jay mackie gruber and eric Bress wrote the screenplay uh based off my story and i think david ellis just he was a stuntman so i think he also directed that scene so well yeah that, it's one of my favorite opening there you know it's only out of all my movies i'll only say one of mine is has one of my favorite horror movies opening all time and it's that one you know but there's others like yeah. some other great but that's one of my favorite openings like i can watch that like it's weird my neighbors probably think i'm like some kind of psycho murderer <laughs> they, they <laughs> well, just hear me up, same here they hear me up late at night and they're like there's a lot of screaming and 
<laughs> yeah. oh, <you're> <laughs> oh, I know. I so often feel like I've got to just turn my volume down <laughs> and just like what, what people think of me. But yeah, like that, I think there is, there's something about it. Like you said, it's that mix of kind of everydayness because we all have driven on freeways. Like I think, you know, with the roller coaster one, as fun as that is, it doesn't quite feel as everyday like it could just happen. Yeah. Whereas there's something specifically about that freeway, that, that, that traffic part, and it's really... It feels like it, I mean, so much of it, of course, was kind of practically done, like you said, and it was stunts, right? And you can just really feel there's something that's like tangible and real about it, isn't there, I think, yeah. you know, it's so clever. I also, yeah. I wanted to kind of set up where, you know, we start off with a group of teenagers and you're like, oh, it's going to be another group of teenagers, you know, and then murder all of them except for um, AJ Cook. Uh, yes. So that was, really, yeah, so I got to do a lot of really... At, at least from a story angle, there were there was so much fun stuff I that I was like, yeah, I get to like fuck around with people in a sequel and do this. So yeah, um, yeah. And and how did you find that one tonally? You know, in terms of compared to the first one, because it it definitely does shift, doesn't it? Like there's there's a lot less time, for example, post that initial accident where people are you know grieving and dealing with what just happened you know like that there's quite a considerable chunk of the first movie where we are spending time with these characters whereas this one it's like yeah. right straight to the you know straight to the kills isn't it basically it it is and and it's always tough because especially when you're in a sequel uh yeah you still you want to care for the characters and you want you yeah you don't you definitely you don't want them to be like oh our friends are dead let's uh go get pizza yeah. um <laughs> Yeah. But for this one, because people will kind of, it's it's almost like it's it's a weird balance because you, kn- the audience knows what's go- going to happen going in, so you don't want to spend so much time with people rehashing like, well, what could this be or what might this be? So you know, I love like the later movies that were just like, well, you heard about Flight One Eighty crashing and then that free like so in the movies like the accidents and the deaths are kind of known so. Mm-hmm. Well, can immediately latch onto it, and then it's like whether you believe it or not, you know that's a little that you can have some gray area there. Um, but yeah, the the gre the the grieving mournfulness kind of kind of went out of went out of them a little bit, which I, for me again, I don't mind it because it's for me they're fun. Yeah. You know, if I want to if I want to grieve, I'll go watch Hereditary and just right. sit sit in grief for hours yeah Yeah, exactly these these (laughs) movies that have that kind of you know they are slasher movies in in a way right where you're you're it's like when you go watch a great friday the 13th movie you're you're watching it for the kind of fun set pieces aren't you more than anything else you know especially it feels like particularly from part two onwards it feels like that's when this this franchise becomes that i suppose yeah Yeah. and you and you still want the characters like i think that they um and i know we're going through them but like that's what i think um, what eric or um part five did so well is um you know i think with part four still adore that movie but we had to that movie they had to write that before the writer strike so it didn't have the development time that all the other final destination movies had they called it the final destination which obviously in horror terms usually means (laughs) we're gonna wrap everything up here and they didn't wrap anything up so the fans kind of went in and expecting it oh we're gonna find out more about tony todd or we're gonna figure out what's you know we're gonna figure out the grand plan um, so I think they were disappointed when that didn't happen. Yeah. Cause, cause it did really well at the box office. Um, mm-hmm. so they're like, well, let's take our time with the next one. And you can tell that part five was like written for the fans because they actually did like make the connections. You know, people were going through breakups and Tony Todd had a lot more, sc- you know, Tony yeah. Todd was a lot. And, um, you know, it had that cool twist about if you kill somebody. So they gave them much you know, they give them more of a moral dilemma to deal with as opposed yes. to, yes. you know, a, a vague clue. So, uh, you know, uh, part five, I, I adore that one as well, you know. Completely agree. I absolutely love it. Let me quickly ask you about, so post part two, yeah. how involved were you with the rest of the series from this point onwards? Yeah, I haven't, honestly, I've, I haven't been really involved except for, you know, like I have a lot of conversations with Craig Perry. Yeah. Um, so he'll sometimes tell he'll bounce ideas off me sometimes where like we're thinking this or this or this um but yeah i haven't been i haven't been really involved in it it's funny because i i i would love to do another one the ego part of me is like i would love to explore other ways you know because 
death design, but it's like death can change that design. So I'd almost love to explore different ways to do it, but I know the studio just doesn't, you know. <laughs> yeah, they, it's so hard. How, do, how that must be hard. Like, as a, I guess this is just what comes with being a screenwriter often, right? But like that idea of you create something or co create something and then you just kind of have to hand it over to someone else, right? It's, it's, it, your, your baby is kind of given to, you know, to uh, someone else to continue. Yeah. And, it, you know, to be honest, like if, like, I don't mind that because I think that's part of the, the good part of working at a studio for so long is I knew I know how the business side of stuff works all the time. So I'm a, able to keep my ego out of it. I just, you know, cause I, I felt like, you know, with the first movie and especially with the second one, like I, I got to like do what I wanted to do with it. And I'm so proud of just the concept and the, you know, like the pattern, death pattern, how it's going, you know, killing them or they would have died. Like all this stuff, that I created is still part of that DNA going forward. Mm. So I, I'm actually, it's interesting to see how other people, you know, kind of interpret that. Um, I would just, like I said, I, I just think there's room to ex- expand the death universe and how death gets people. Like, again, I love the Rube Goldberg aspect of it, but I think there's, you could say death has a new design and kind of try something fresh. Mm. Um, but you know, obviously people go to see Final Destination for the Rube Goldberg stuff. So it's like, yeah, yeah. you know. What were your thoughts on on Final Destination 3 and 4 and 5? Like, did you go see them at the theater? Were you kind of involved pre that, like pre-release in any way? Like wh- wh- when did yeah, you no, kind I of first to, discover them? Um, I went to, I think I went to a test screening of 4, but then I went to, I've been to the premieres of all the other ones. Uh, um, but I think part, I think part 4 was the one I went to a, test screening for um and no it's like it's it's fun they're they're all fun and they're and they're all different you know they've all got their tonal they've all got their tonal kind of shifts i I, three i like i I, they're like i'm not a big fan of like gratuitous nudity so i think that tanning bed scene always irks me yeah Um, yeah because actually there's not a lot of there's not a lot of nudity or, or sex in these movies generally, right? And yeah. you're right. Like, I think re-watching them again, that nudity in that part three does kind of stick out almost a little bit, doesn't it, from everything yeah. else? Yeah. Yeah, there was like a, there was a flash of boobs in, in the second one. Um, yeah. Like a second, but... And it's... And I have not... Like, again, I've written movies with, like, sex in them, and, I'll, you know, if if, it, if a story requires... Like, it's not like I'm anti-sex in movies. It's just, like, when I grew up, it was just such you know, it was just so gratuitous. It's like, oh, let's just get, you know, this lady naked in the shower for five minutes and then kill her. Um, so yeah, the Tanya bed scene in three is the only, I think the only scene in the franchise that I don't like, cause it goes on so long. It's like, you know, they take their tops off and then they jiggle around to music. Yeah. And, and I know all the straight guys are like, so what's your fault? No, but just creatively, <laughs> creatively, it's just like, and then they lay in the tanning bed with their tops off forever and then they start getting fried. It, it's just such a long ass scene um, yeah. that I was like, "Oh, that that's just that's just too much." Yeah, uh, and also two of the most fun characters. I think they kill off too early. So yeah, <laughs> like keep yeah. them in no, it for they, a bit longer too. They were really fun. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, but, but three I I, I like because it was it kind of brought back James and Glenn's like dark humor. I mean, they mm. to, they 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 did get to add a character saying please tell me I don't die with something going up my butt. They did get to add guys saying that. So, so they got that gay stuff. They got that homophobic stuff in there. Um, yeah, yeah. I'm halfway kidding. Um, so yeah, I enjoy three. I enjoyed four again. I, I know, I know people rag on it because they, you know, they just don't feel like, you know, but again, I just know the behind the scenes stuff is, you know, Eric's a great writer and, but he had a very short, they went, they decided to greenlight the movie very, when it looked like the strike was getting, when they were like, oh, the strike's really going to happen. We better greenlight this. So they just like, write, you know, and then we're taking your first, you know what I'm saying? So he didn't yeah. have to yeah. develop the script, but I still think it's really fun. Like, you know, NASCAR fun you know because it's interesting because it's directed by david ellis as well isn't it who directed part two yeah but it doesn't necessarily feel like it has that sort of i think there's more cgi right and obviously it's 3d so there's like a lot more of that kind of stuff going on and i wonder if that also it it somehow doesn't have the kind of like the weight of those stunts that david directed in part two for example yeah it's hard when you start doing stuff 
stuff in 3D because it's a whole different shooting process. Mm. But again, as as far as a f- fun movie, I mean, I like that's the thing is like there there aren't any that I don't like. Yeah. Like I you know, and I, and I would be honest, like if there was like one in the franchise that I, you know, didn't like, and I'm like, oh, that you know, but but I'm also because I've been in the business so long, I've kind of had to because a lot of my films have you know started off like studio films, but then companies merge and then it goes into turn around and the movie gets made for like two hundred thousand dollars yeah so i've kind of had to you know adjust my thinking when i look at kind of my just all my movies um and the only one that i don't like is the first one i did which was return to cabin by the lake which is a tv movie um and the only reason that that one i i don't like is because i it's a sequel to cabin this movie cabin by the lake and it had Judd Nelson in it. And I wrote a really good script. Like, because I'm like, all right, this has to be good enough for Judd Nelson to want to come back and play this character again. And then um, they greenlit it. Judd Nelson read it, signed on. And then the, st- uh, the studio executive decided that the script was too clever for the USA audience. Wow. So he he literally had somebody come in and dumb, the, like, just dumb the script down to, like, super basic storytelling and then i think the director got annoyed because he almost directed it like a comedy uh so the producer was not she's like i can't even she goes i can't even watch this movie without crying she goes i can't i don't want to i can't send you like i won't send you an early screening of it because it's just gonna like oh. bother you and then yeah. i saw it on tv and i was like oh, oh. awful but yeah, yeah i've liked all my other films you know for flaws and all of course um, yeah and and actually the final all of the final destination films like i think it's generally considered among so many horror fans right you know we have so many big franchises out there with five or more entries that have their real highs and real lows right i would say that final destination is up there with maybe the chucky movies and maybe the scream movies as the most consistently fun and quality yeah. horror franchise right like and uh, you know and i think that's a really lovely thing and and kind of unusual in a way that five was a defi- well it felt at the time like a definitive full stop like a definitive ending on that on that saga as well right like yes. which is a really interesting thing considering how popular these movies were but like it seemed like that was the idea right for five to kind of round everything off i i think to me i don't think it was to end it um because because i'm 99 percent sure that craig had that idea for the ending and they were originally going to do that for part four I mean, yeah, because the movies, the movies have all done done well, and it's just, you know, the only difference between our movies, like, pr- it probably were on the same thing as the Scream level, but they're not cheap to make, like, you know, yeah. Blumhouse budgets right. of like five million, um, so they cost a little bit more, especially when you do them in three D, um, uh, because of the set pieces and everything, but, but yeah, no, it's been, I mean, the fans of, you know, it's one of those franchises, you know, obviously I'm biased because I'm the creator of it, and it's like I want more, like, yeah. Why does Friday the Thirteenth have like ninety? I know it's not ninety, but like you know, twenty <laughs> spin-offs and all this other stuff. And we've only had five movies um, so far. Um, but you know, Scream just did five and six last the last year. So um, we're mm-hmm. gonna get we're finally gonna catch up with Scream. But um, but yeah. So is it is it definitely happening? Yes. A, a new Final Destination, right? It is. Yeah, right. That's very. That's super exciting. Is there any anything? Do, do you know much about it? What is? Are, are you involved in any way in this? Um, movie? I know all about it, but I'm not <laughs> working on it. Sure. But I can't yeah. say anything. Um. Yeah, but I yeah. yeah. There there it's it's it is happening. Most of the stuff on the internet, like that, has been you know, fan art and fan stuff over the years it's not related to any of that. Um, and there should be, there should be an announcement coming out, you know, by the summer about an update, you know, what's going on. Some specific, specific details. John Watts, who did the Spider-Man movies came up with the story. They brought in a superstar team on this one. So yeah, yeah, I'm really excited with the story and, where they're going with it because it's it is going to be it is going to be different it's not going to be like like what i was about earlier about like changing deaths mo complete you know and it's not going to be like yeah. a re like completely revamping it but um mm-hmm. they've got a very they've got a very clever story so it's not just you know accident somebody shows up and says here's a rule to get out of this 
mm-hmm. and they try to follow the rules. So it's um, there's a lot more going on. So um, that's awesome because like and and you know horror has horror has changed a lot in the last decade, right? It feels like we've kind of entered a new, almost sort of golden age of the genre since we've had people like. Jordan Peele and you know uh, Mike Flanagan, Ari Aster, yeah. uh, you know Robert Eggers and people like this, right? And horror has kind of gone off in a different direction. But I do feel like also there is such a want now for these like fun, beloved horror properties that are coming back. Like you said, we we we've got Scream back. We've had some new Halloween movies. Yeah, it feels like a perfect time, right, to bring Final Destination yeah. back. I think. Yeah. yeah. Somebody pointed out it was like if. It's been twelve years, so if the movie comes out next year, it'll be thir- it'll come out on the th- it'll be thirteen years since the last one. I'm like, perfect. You could have made a lot of yeah, but you could have made a lot more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I want a fucking so Final Destination every two years, motherfuckers. Right? I mean, you could. I mean, we could have a Netflix miniseries now. Uh, Final we, Destination. We pushed. Yeah, yeah. There's the movies for now. Yeah, fair enough, fair enough. Yeah. Um, I guess it's, like you said, I guess also it's an expensive, I never really thought about that, but I guess compared to a lot of kind of slasher franchises, they must be pretty expensive to to make. These yeah, movies. you could yeah. do it. You could do a series that wouldn't be that expensive, though. Yeah, yeah. But, but yeah, like, yeah, put that out in the universe. I mean, it's all, Absolutely. I always say I'm guardedly optimistic. I've just got to start being, like, fake, positively optimistic, where I just think everything's going to happen that I want to happen. That's yeah. my goal starting at this moment. So, yeah, let's we, make it happen. We I would love that. Be, yeah. I, I would love it. We do need more Final Destination out there yeah. in the world. I love <laughs> it. Uh, just a couple of final questions for you, um, Jeffrey. Mm. And I know you probably get asked this so much, but what is your favorite set piece from this whole series? If you had to pick one, um, what's your favorite kind of death slash kind of you know set piece in general? I, I always have a double answer for that one. I cannot lie. Yeah. Uh, um, if it's a well, oh well, no, my favorite set piece is the log truck opening. Um, so people ask me what my favorite deaths are. That's okay. Yeah, my, the log truck opening that uh, that's my favorite set, like a set piece. Sure, yeah, sure, sure. Favorite death though, I've got to ask you then. What's your favorite? Yeah, death? well, it's two. I lo- it's it's for an awful reason, but I like Todd's death in the first one. Yeah, when he because it's so real and it's so like agreed painful. and it's i don't quite, like no, that that's like it's kind of the most emotionally gut punching yeah. set piece in the whole franchise i think yeah yeah it's, yeah and 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 i hate real life violence and you know i i cry if anybody dies so i, well, I don't want to sound sadistic saying that but um and then i have to say the gymnastic scene in part five <laughs> yes <laughs> like that was the first time that i've been in one of those movies and actually screamed like a baby <laughs> not like it was i was like what the fuck like because yeah. yeah just the way well spoiler i'll just yeah yeah it's, it's not only with her son but when she lands and it cracks her body in two oh, i'll just bah! like i literally screamed out in the theater and that hasn't happened to me um in any of the other ones um, it's genuinely shocking that moment, it was isn't it? Really, so good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I love it. Um, perfect. Well, um, I think that's it. Thank you so much, um, Jeffrey, for joining me. It's been so such such a joy to kind of hear your memories and experiences of these movies. And um, is there anything that you've got? Like, you know, you're you're a busy screenwriter. Is there anything that you've got kind of coming up um this year that anyone should keep a lookout for? As long as the strike, you know, the screen actors goal doesn't go on strike, I'll be um, directing my first slasher movie uh, <gasps> this summer, so I'm really excited about that. Oh wow, amazing! Anything you can tell us about that? Not yet. <laughs> only, <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, I can't yet, yeah, but uh, only that it'll. Um, it's a very cool setup. It's a you know yeah. I, it is going to be like an. It's going to be an old school slasher film. Um, not meta like it's you know it's. You know, it's an old school kind of slasher film, so I'm really excited about it. Yes, yes. Um, I love this. I also think, like, let's bring back the slasher properly as well, yeah. you know? Like, not just in an ironic way, but I would love to see the return of proper slashers again. Yeah, this, yeah. This, there's no irony in this in this slasher movie. Um, Amazing. So I'm really excited about that. And, um, yeah, I'm producing a couple of, of projects. Um, one that's getting ready to shoot down in Dallas. Um yeah so so yeah i'm staying busy i just i you know i'm gonna go pick it in a little bit for the strike 
Um, so, um, Hopefully that doesn't go on too long. Um, wonderful. Well, Jeffrey, thank you so much for your time. My last question, again, a, probably a question you get asked a lot, but I have to ask all my guests. What is your favorite ever horror film? Nightmare on Elm Street. Oh, perfect choice. Yeah. The, I, I, and I take it you mean the 1984 yes, the, the, the original. The original. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, absolutely incredible uh jeffrey thank you so much for joining me oh my pleasure have a great evening over there and i'll have a great day over here and that's it for this week's bonus episode and my interview with jeffrey reddick really hope you guys enjoyed listening to that it was a real treat to get to sit down and chat to jeffrey about those brilliant movies and don't forget if you want to listen to our final destination retrospective discussions deep dive discussions of all five movies then sign up to our patreon patreon.com slash evolution of horror thank you so much for listening and join us again soon for another episode of the evolution of horror 